The book, uh, The Faith of the Faithless, is about faith, as the title would suggest. But more than that, it's about love, um, about love, which is a very embarrassing word to say for a half-dead, obsessional, inhibited, self-hating Englishman who hates England, such as myself, to say that in public. But it's about love, which is something new in my work and newer than I'd like to imagine in my life. And the faith of the faithless is an openness to love, as giving what one does not have and receiving that over which one has no power. And this book is dedicated to my, with love to my wife, Jameson. And finally, I want to thank Cornell. I respect Cornell, I admire Cornell. Damn it, I wanna be Cornell or just <laughs> a tiny, have a tiny fraction of your eloquence and intelligence. And I'm honored and, and flattered that you took the time to be with us in Brooklyn tonight. It's a pleasure. Um, we have interacted before, but it, this is uh, very special that you're here. Um, Cornell's from here and I'm from over there, but because of the vagaries of the English class system where white working class kids grew up in the 60s and 70s listening to black American music, I grew up listening to the same music as Cornell, and this would be another conversation for another time, and I'm sort of serious about this and doing this at BAM, we could and should have a serious philosophical conversation about music and about poetry and about the great Otis Redding, James Brown, Al Green, Bootsy Collins, Parliament, Funkadelic, and the sacred and true President Clinton, George, not Bill, and the greatest of them all, the poet and activist Curtis Mayfield. And we should take a moment to recall that the dreadful accident that paralyzed Curtis Mayfield and the precipitated premature death happened not far from here in Wingate Park uh, in Brooklyn, just the other side of Prospect Park. Cornell and I have picked over a couple of philosophical bones in the past on my idea of philosophy beginning disappointment, on my implicit romanticism, my kind of disappointed romanticism. Uh, for Cornell, there is no disappointment because there was never any appointment in the first place. There is no disillusion because there was never any illusion. It's just been the same old shit since the beginning, piling up ever higher. We can call it civilization, and it smells bad. And I accept his Chekhovian critique, his Sophoclean critique of my position, which, um, and I've also tried to rethink in the new work that critique, and I think that hopefully becomes clear in the light of some of the things I want to say about violence, and in particular the history of violence. I'm also eager to hear what he's got to say about religion and my views on religion. I remember in a debate a few years ago at the new school asking him why he is a Christian. And I guess he might well ask me the same question now. I was undecided about what to do. I thought about giving a reading in a refined BBC cadence, but then I thought that would be dull, and if you want to read the book, if you feel so inclined, you can. If you don't, it's up to you. But I don't want this to be dull. So I decided to wing it and then hang over, hand over to Cornell, and then we can have a talk and open it out. Uh, I begin from a simple observation. We live in a world increasingly defined by religiously motivated political violence, and this needs to be analyzed and thought through. Somehow we seem to have passed from what we were told when I was a kid was a secular age which we were ceaselessly told was post-religious to a new situation in which political action seems to flow directly from religious metaphysical conflict. This situation could be triangulated around the often fatal entanglement of politics and religion where the third vertex of the triangle is violence. Politics, religion, and violence appear to define the present through which we're all too precipitously passing in which religiously justified violence is the means to a political end. How to respond to that situation? How to respond to this triangulation of religion, politics, and violence? Must one defend a version of secularism or quietly accept the slide into some sort of theism? My argument attempts to refuse that 
either or option. Maybe there's another way and that's what I hope to um, the hypothesis of a faith of the faithless. But more about that in a second. Let me make a remark about the relationship between politics and religion. Without an understanding of the intrication of politics and religion, we have little hope of comprehending our present. What the present reveals is a series of grim parallels. One, Islamism, jihadism, in its diverse forms where political action is entirely legitimated in religious terms, where Osama bin Laden justified Al-Qaeda in terms of an opposition to the Zionist Crusaders and vindicated his own position in terms of a logic of martyrdom. Two, military neoliberalism, where the theology of the free market is combined with a providential understanding of freedom, democracy, and human rights, and employs asymmetrical, excessive military power to prosecute a war on terror that's justified in terms of a clash of civilizations, where civilization is an implicitly imperialist concept. Three, Zionism, in which the state of Israel is based on an identity of politics and religion, and where any critique of the political regime can therefore be condemned as anti, an anti-Semitic religious slur. Four, social democratic conservatism, where countries like the Netherlands, Denmark, France, Switzerland, and even dear old Finland, and all across Europe, purportedly defend their traditions of tolerance, integration, and the benefits of the welfare state in a thinly disguised racism against alleged immigrants who are often second and third generation nationals and who are coded as Islamic and accused of not being willing to integrate into mainstream society. And the list could be continued. More broadly, uh, the history of modern political forms for me is not centered on the transition from the religious to the secular, a transition that would allegedly parallel that from the pre-modern to the modern, rather the history of modern political forms, republicanism, liberal democracy, fascism, Bolshevism, is best understood as a series of metamorphoses of sacralization. Metamorphoses of sacralization. Modern politics takes place within an economy of the sacral, a violent economy, in particular the passage or ambivalence of the passage between the transcendent and the imminent, where God the king becomes God the people. We're living through a chronic re-theologization of politics, the intrication of politics and religion defined by violence, and that's what I'm trying to think through in this project. I want to do this not in order to break the connection between politics and religion, though, but to acknowledge the limitation of any completely secularist politics, particularly on the left. It seems to me that the left has also easily ceded the ground, the religious ground, to the right. And it's this ground that needs to be regained in a coherent, long-term, and tenacious political war of position, as Gramsci would say. And Gramsci also wrote, we shouldn't forget that socialism is the religion that's needed to kill off Christianity. In other words, and here I'm being a little partisan, which is bad, isn't it? Is belief something that only they have? Right? Is faith something that only they have? People like Mitt Romney, what on earth do Mormons believe? Or Newt Gingrich, who say they believe, but can we have belief too? Can we have faith too? This is what I have in mind with the locution faith of the faithless. Now, of course, Barack Obama comes to mind here. Think all the way back if you can. It's painful, I know, to the heady days of the presidential campaign in 2008. His campaign was often reduced to one word, believe, right? believe. I've turned a critical eye towards Obama elsewhere, but it's worth noting that his political genius, and the word is not too strong, lies in his combination of the rhetorical force of religion, in particular the eloquence of historically black Christianity, with a defense of classical constitutional American liberalism. But Obama, in my view, is not a Christian, he is a deist. He believes in a God but a God that does not intervene in the world, a God that does not perform miracles, 
a non-prophetic God, a God who is subordinate to law, to the rule of law, a God who underwrites the Constitution but never overrides it. Obama is a liberal Democrat, and liberal democracy is the rule of the rule, the reign of law that renders impotent anything that would break with law, the miraculous, the moment of the event. Liberal democracy is a political deism governed by the hidden and divine hand of the market. It's here that we could revisit the whole debate with Jeremiah Wright and Obama from 2008. And I'm sure that will be back on the agenda in the coming months as Republican candidates play that race card. Putting Obama's deism to one side, what meaning might, fi might faith still have? Can there be a political faith that would neither be a right-wing distortion of Christianity nor a liberal deism where God does nothing but something else, what I'm calling a faith of the faithless? Might there also be a political faith, a rigorous and activist conception of faith? The book begins and ends with two parables. The first parable has Oscar Wilde as its hero. The second has Kierkegaard and Kierkegaard's works of love. Where what interests me in Kierkegaard is his emphasis upon the rigor of love and the essential insecurity of faith. But what caught my eye in Wilde was a quotation from his text De Profundis, which is sort of the germ of the book. In captivity in a stinking cell in Reading, in England, writing on one sheet a day, the one sheet that he was granted. And when he finished the one sheet, he was given another sheet the next day. Having lost everything and become completely ruined, hated and vilified, Wilde writes, when I think of religion at all, I feel as if I would like to found an order for those who cannot believe. The confraternity of the faithless, one might call it, where on an altar on which no taper burned, a priest in whose heart peace had no dwelling, might celebrate with unblessed bread and a chalice empty of wine. Everything to be true must become a religion, and agnosticism should have its ritual, no less than faith. A confraternity or a consorority of the faithless. It's that line, everything to be true must become a religion, that interests me most. What does true mean in that instance? What do I mean by faith? Faith is not a belief in some metaphysical entity. It is rather a lived subjective commitment to what I call an infinite demand. Faith is infinitely demanding. This is the kind of demand issued by Jesus when he said in the Sermon on the Mount, blessed are the cheesemakers. So I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> He means the makers of all dairy products. When Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount says, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, listen to this, do good to them that hate you and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Matthew 5, 44. Christ is not stating something that might be simply followed through or carried out. Jesus' ethical demand is a ridiculous demand. It puts the ethical subject into a situation of sheer ethical overload. But in my view, ethics is all about overload. When Christ in the same sermon says, be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect, he doesn't for, imagine, doesn't for a moment imagine that such perfection is attainable at least not in this life, as it would require the equality of the human and the divine, which is heretical. What such a demand does is to expose our imperfection and failure, and we wrestle with the force of the demand and the facts of the situation. The force of the demand and the facts of the situation. Was it God, Jesus Messiah, who made this demand, or just some troublesome rabbi in occupied Palestine? We don't know, and furthermore, it doesn't matter. The ethical demand is not dependent upon divine command. It's the demand that matters, the infinite demand and the way it structures subjectivity. 
the way it structures what I see as the powerless power of being human that we call conscience. And at the center of this book is an analysis of conscience. I could say a lot more about that. But faith is an enactment in relationship to a calling. And what calls is beyond our power and institutes a performative powerlessness in the self. So for me, faith is not exhausted by belief in a deity. It's a declarative act, an enactment of the self in relationship to a calling. Now, this conception of faith is not just shared by the denominationally faithless, but can be experienced by them perhaps in an exemplary way. Faith is not then necessarily theistic. However, and this should have been, uh, this is a, a constant concern in, of my work, an agnostic conception of faith should not be triumphalist. I have little sympathy with the arrogance and very English, very Oxonian evangelical atheism of Richard Dawkins or Christopher Hitchens, fused by, into one mythical being recently by Terry Eagleton called Ditchkins, okay, that sees God and religion as some sort of historical error that has happily been corrected, corrected and refuted by scientific progress. On the contrary, the religious tradition with which I'm most familiar, broadly Judeo-Christian, is a powerful way of articulating questions of the ultimate meaning and value of human life in ways irreducible to naturalism, in ways irreducible to natural science. Thinkers whose company I have long valued, like Paul, Augustine, and Pascal, raise exactly the right questions, even though I cannot always accept their answers. Furthermore, when it comes to the political question, the political question of what might motivate a subject to act in concert with others, rationality alone is insufficient. In order that a legitimate political association might become possible, possible, that is, in order that citizens might pledge themselves to some conception of the good, reason has to be allied to questions of faith and belief that are able to touch the deep existential matrix of human subjectivity. So in short, neither traditional theism for me nor evangelical atheism will suffice. It's not so much a question as it was for a great thinker who um, was executed at the end of the Second World War, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, of speaking of God without religion. It's rather a question of how we speak of religion as a force that combined human beings together in association without God. Here, religion is linked to religare, as that which binds fast in association. So religion for me is linked to the idea of that which binds fast in association. Furthermore, oh, this is a separate topic I was discussing yesterday with Rolo Romic. It's a question of opposing or contrasting an activist and pra practical sense of religion to that dreadful spreading virus that's called spirituality. Right? Here I've been arguing for an opposition almost between a discourse of religion and a discourse of spirituality. For me, the being of politics is association. It's that which binds fast, religare. Politics is association without representation. Not a contract, not a parliament, not a congress, not norm normal governmental politics, but the act of association. What Marx called in Capital One an association of free human beings. Faith without love is as Paul says, a noisy gong, a clanging symbol. It must be underwritten by love. As I already said, the newest idea for me in Faith of the Faithless is the emphasis on the idea of love, in particular the idea of mystical love. And the amazing testimonies and texts that I was trying to engage with, in particular of female, medieval female mystics like Marguerite, Porret, who in many ways is one of the, the heroes of the book. For people like this, love is not some kind of tepid contract or 
as Hegel would say, a dialectic of dependence or an independence, nor is love some kind of constant state. Love is an act of spiritual daring that attempts to eviscerate and excoriate the old self in order that something new might come into being. Love dares the self to leave itself behind, to enter into poverty and to engage with its own annihilation, to hew and hack away at the self to make a space that's large enough for love to enter. It's the way Porret puts it. Love as both impoverishment and enrichment of the self, an enrichment through impoverishment, an audacity and act of endurance in giving what one does not have and receiving that over which one has no power is difficult. <laughs> the question motivating much of my previous work can be very simply stated, how to live, how to live. Right? The response to that question immediately turns on the question of the relationship to mortality. To philosophize is to learn how to die. That's how to live. For reasons that I'm trying to clarify in this new stuff, the question how to live has become the question how to love. Love is not just as strong as death, it is stronger. Now, I'm going to wrap up now, but the, um, there's much more I'd like to emphasize, which I... I won't uh, and can't. The first thing, just to, to, to list them, to talk about the theme of fiction, which is a big theme in the book, and the, the idea of the supreme fiction, which is a fiction that we know to be a fiction in which we can still believe. I borrow that from the great uh, American poet Wallace Stevens. The second theme that I'd like to say more about would be on the nature of infinite demands in politics or a demandless politics that touches on some of what's been happening so gloriously in um, Occupy Wall Street. Thirdly, I would like to talk about the nature of political resistance and the significant differences between the kind of anarchism that I think my position lends itself to and forms of neo-Leninist authoritarianism. Fourthly, there's also the theme of nihilism, which I'm just going to pass over for a second. <laughs> Get me into too much trouble. I'll be finished with a word about violence. I try and argue in this, um, in this book for what I call in the last chapter a non-violent violence, which sounds like having your cake and, and eating it, and it probably is. But the question that I'm trying to deal with is a question, is a very simple question. Uh, a very difficult question to answer, though. Um, violence is not uh, one thing. Right? Violence cannot be reduced to one act. Violence is always uh, a sequence. Violence is a phenomenon that has a history. Violence is always at least two. It's always a play of violence and counter-violence and a movement of violence and counter-violence that goes back the generations, goes back into history. And history seems to be a history of violence. Both the violence and the counter-violence are justified in their terms, and the wheel turns. Now, I talk in this, this argument about uh, Franz Fanon in particular. And Fanon would argue that violence is never an abstract concept for the colonized. Historical amnesia and incuriousness about the violence of the past is the luxury of the oppressor. And the colonized subject lives the historical violence of their expropriation viscerally, all the way to psychosis in the case of uh, the ones that uh, Fanon analyzed. So the question that I'm trying to deal with here is if history is this seemingly unending cycle of violence and counter-violence, the same old stuff moving around, how does one arrest that cycle? And what plausibility might 
an ethics and politics of nonviolence have in the face of the history of violence that we come from. And I don't have an answer to that question that would convince everybody in the room, but I try and wrestle with that in the last chapter. Um, but it means acknowledging that um, it means acknowledging that nonviolence is not a principle, it's not a law, it's not a categorical imperative. It is what Walter Benjamin calls in an extraordinary phrase, a guideline. It's a guideline for action. And a guideline for action in a situation of violence. In a situation where that guideline of nonviolence is going to be possibly broken. So what I try and analyze at the end of the book is the way in which the commandment of nonviolence, thou shalt not kill, is not an absolute prohibition. It's a fragile guideline for action whose force arises in a situation where it might be transgressed. Violence might well become necessary, but never justified. I think that's the key distinction. So to finish, um, politics for me is action that situates itself in the conflict between a commitment to nonviolence and the historical violence of the reality into which we're inserted, which requires an ever compromised and ever imperfect action that's guided by an infinite ethical demand. So on my view, politics is action, it's invention, which never has clean hands. It's a question of how dirty you're prepared for your hands to be. And um, I guess what shifted in uh, uh, my position, you know, which is, touches on a conversation we had some years ago, is that I used to argue for a kind of blanket nonviolence position. I think that's, uh, that, that, that's, uh, that's myopic. We need a much more subtle understanding of the, um, the risks of violence, of the necessity of violence in certain contexts. And we need um, uh, the problem with the principled idea of nonviolence is that it ends up putting, one's, putting one on the side of the oppressor, right? Because the argument will always be, once you uh, adopt a principle of nonviolence and you become violent, you betray yourself, right? And the situation is just much more complicated than that. And maybe that's something we can uh, think about, but I'd like to hand over to Cornell West. Wonderful. Thank you so much, my brother. What a blessing for me to be here at the Brooklyn Academy of Music. I want to begin by thanking my new friend and dear sister, Via Lynn, and her visionary leadership at this space, and Sister Molly, who works with her, and also Sister Jessica Verso for helping facilitate this gathering. I always look forward to being in critical dialogue with my dear brother, Simon Critchley. We started years ago at the New School. We were there last year again in the snow with James Miller and the others. We're in Brooklyn this year and next year. Look for us maybe in the Bronx. We just don't know. <laughs> but we're going to sustain this philosophical and political engagement, not only because we love the subject matter, but also because we love each other. Simon Critchley is one of those philosophers whose work I read regularly and religiously. You come across an author, it could be Eric Albach in Literary Criticism, or M. H. Abrams, or Harold Bloom, or Edward Said, it could be Muriel Rukeyser's poetry, it could be Toni Morrison's novels. You choose certain figures to say you're going to read everything they produce. Why? Because it allows you to undergo your endless paideia that deep education that forces you to wrestle with your soul to engage in that kind of 
soul turning that Plato talks about in the middle of the book, in the middle of the Republic. It's a way in which everything is at stake in what they are writing. So it's not academic in the worst sense. It's intellectual in the best sense. And what I love about Simon Critchley is he does, in fact, take very seriously my two primary traditions, which is the Socratic legacy of Athens and the prophetic legacy of Jerusalem, and he dips it in those who are attempting to struggle against, resist, be resilient in the face of structures of domination and various forms of oppression, which is to say what is so rare, and this is what separates certain thinkers. He begins with the catastrophic, like Benjamin, like Du Bois, like Kafka, the first line of the metamorphosis, catastrophic transformed into a huge, vicious, ugly vermin. But usually, philosophers, critics are so deodorized, they don't want to deal with that kind of funk. They want to stay on the surface, maybe get to the problematic. No, we begin with the catastrophic, which is very different than just the problematic. And that's one of the reasons why his response to the starting point of most of the kinds of philosophers who I tend to be attracted to, they begin with line 607b of book 10 of Plato's Republic, the traditional quarrel between poetry and philosophy. And he decides to engage in a form of philosophizing that goes to school with the poets because usually it's the poets, and by poets I include musicians. Beethoven called himself a poet of tones. John Coltrane is a poet of sounds, so we're including poets in the broader sense, the way Shelley understood it in that last line of the 1821 pamphlet, Defense of Poetry. Poets are the unacknowledged legislators of the world. And he wasn't just talking about versifiers. All human beings who muster the courage to have imagination to conceive of a different world and use bits of this world to attempt to transform the present world into something in light of that world you imagine. So the supremacy of empathy and imagination in that sense. And this is very rare because most of our philosophers since Descartes have gone to school with science and mathematics. It's the difference between Vico and Descartes. Vico begins with corpses. Humanda, where our word humanity and humility come from. What does it mean to be human? Burying, that's where, what humando means in the Latin. You begin with the corpses, which is even more concrete than Heidegger's beginning with death. Death is too abstract for a brother like me. I'm with Bootsy Collins and George Clinton. I begin with the funk. <laughs> and corpses stink. But there's also deep love and freedom in that funk. We'll get to that later. Or, or really quicker than I think, because I'm not going to speak too long. When the but the important thing is this metaphilosophical point. That Simon Critchley can be talking about Daddy Da. He can be talking about Merle Ponty, he can be talking about Heidegger, he can be talking about Rousseau. And this text is full of some of the most wonderful close readings of Rousseau's social contract and its juxtaposition with the Geneva man manuscript, the first version of that work of 1762. And close readings of being in time, Heidegger's classic of 1927, very close readings of Badu and a Joe Frazier, Muhammad Ali like slug him out with Zizek, in that last chapter, you all are slugging it out. And he's wrote Joe Frazier in the first match. <laughs> this brother wins. And I don't think Zizek's coming back, actually, the way Muhammad Ali did. But it's still, it's an intellectual kind of engagement in that regard. But beginning with the metaphysical point of going to school with the poets, which means going to school with history, memory, story, narrative, metaphors, metonymies, synecdoches, those things we human beings mobilize in our move from mother's womb to tomb, which means it is existential. 
Everything is at stake. Life, death, sadness, sorrow, joy, pleasure, and love. Echoes of Plato's definition of philosophy. Philosophia, love of wisdom is a meditation on and preparation for death. But not just death as a physical event, but as Montaigne says, to philosophize to learn how to die, which means mustering the courage to critically examine yourself so when you let a certain assumption go, that's a form of death and there is no rebirth without death. You must learn to die if you're going to undergo paideia, if you're going to undergo deep education as opposed to cheap schooling, which is on the market model which is predominant more and more these days. A lot of cheap schooling going on, skills, truncated knowledge, as opposed to life transformation, profound wisdom. That's why I believe in the Sankofa bird. You don't move forward unless you look back first and see the best. In that sense, he's the best of a subversive traditionalist or a traditional subversive because he's in conversation with the best of those because of the centrality of memory and history. So he believes in radical historicity. The thick circumstantiality of each and every one of us born in circumstances not of our own choosing. Heidegger's notion of throneness, the nullity of throneness. We find ourselves thrown in the world through our mother's womb, love push that got us out, and our bodies will be the culinary del delight of terrestrial worms one day, soon. That's a certain kind of thrownness too, and the worms appreciate it. Unless you're out for cremation. So that's the wrestling of what it means to be human. But this radical historicity is tied to a radical humility back to the humando of Vico. A radical humility, that's very, very rare. And not just intellectual discourse, but philosophic discourse. That's why Chekhov hated philosophers, he says in one of his famous letters. He said, all these philosophers are like generals. They want to enlist you in their army. They're not interested in truth. They're interested in victory. They want you to join their school, be a Platonist. Be an Aristotelian, be an Epicurean, be a Stoic, be a Hegelian, be a Marxist, be a Whiteheadian. How narrow. Plato was not a Platonist. Read the dialogues. Aristotle was not an Aristotelian. That's for the epigons. That's for those who come after in the same way that Jesus was not a Christian, but we get into that a little later. He was a Jewish brother, right? <laughs> like Hillel and a whole lot of other Jewish brothers. But the idea of being free, being free to learn how to die is to unlearn slavery. That's what Seneca says. We don't respect, we don't expect too much profundity from the Romans. They're so busy conquering the world rather than understanding it. But Seneca was in conversation with the best of those who came before as well. So that radical historicity, grounded in history, but tied not just to context, but to catastrophe. The reality one cannot not know. The kind of suffering that the Graham family's going through right now with the police shooting that brother in his chest. That's the reality you cannot not know. You feel it at the visceral level. You feel it at the raw level and the ways in which these various forms of suffering, be it psychic, be it political, be it economic, affect each and every one of us in our short trek from mama's womb to tomb. That's Simon Critchley. That's why he's my kind of philosopher that way. It's a radical humility. Now, when it comes to religion, even though we may disagree on the God question, he's such a soulmate, though you are. You really are, because in wrestling with, 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 with death and learning how to die and then therefore wrestling with life, uh, it reminds me of the great George Santayana and his definition of religion in that 1913 classic of his, Winds of Doctrine. He said, religion is the love of life in the consciousness of impotence. 
Religion is the love of life in the consciousness of impotence. And in some ways, he was building on probably the greatest set of lectures ever given on religion as an existential phenomenon, not so much as a sociological phenomenon. This is the great William James, of course, in the Gifford Lectures, and the varieties of religious experience at the very end of those lectures in Edinburgh. He says, now I come to the core of the religious problem. You can imagine folk calling in the back. What is it, James? What is it? He said, help, exclamation point. Help, exclamation point. That's the core of it. The call for help. And you get the literary rendition and depiction of this in the second greatest comic work ever written in American civilization, named Nathaniel West's great work, Miss Lonely Hearts. Of course, the first is Mark Twain, Huckleberry Finn, but number two is old brother Nathan Weinstein, who renamed himself Nathaniel West, so he's not my cousin, not related to me, but he is my soulmate. And in that first chapter, Mrs. Lonely Heart, help, help, a direct, conscious, deliberate interpretation and appropriation of James's Gifford Lectures. Because Mrs. Lonely Heart is what? A Christ figure, a pseudo-Christ figure. For some, an anti-Christ figure, but somebody who looking for some external authority in order to gain some help. And what I love about Simon Critchley, and this is very different with my dear brother, the late Christopher Hitchens, who I love very much and respected very much. I just had profound disagreements. Christopher Hitchens was very brilliant, but he was not religiously musical. He was tone deaf and flat footed when it came to religion. So he's a reductionist. He becomes a kind of dogma in atheistic space, a secular dogmatist. Just like religious folk have to be secularly musical to, to be able to read atheistic and agnostic texts with great empathy and openness that secular folk need to read religious texts and religious phenomena was a sense not just of openness but what they are wrestling with. How are you gonna to come to terms with the structure of meaning in your own life, the structure of feeling in your own life? How are you gonna deal with catastrophe in your own context, individual as well as collective? How will you respond when you're terrorized, traumatized, stigmatized, and so forth and so on? All of us have to come to terms with those questions, whatever narratives we mobilize. They can be secular narratives, they can be religious narratives, whatever. And in a certain sense, that's all we have, are just these stories and these narratives. And Simon Critchley is very, very sensitive to the ways in which these narratives can be mobilized. That's why he can end with such a magnificent reading of Kierkegaard's 1847 text, Works of Love. You say, oh, well, Simon, he's a deep, not just a Christian, he's a Christocentric radical. He's so obsessed with that first century Palestinian Jew named Jesus, he doesn't even conceive of any alternatives for him. And here comes secular Simon Critchley. Watch me appropriate this Danish Christian. Watch me give a reading of love. Why? Because I'm on the love train too. I don't need to have a cognitive commitment to God talk to be on the love train and to learn much from this deeply Christocentric Danish Christian, I mean, a poet and thinker, because that's really what Kierkegaard is. He's not even a theologian. He's first and foremost a poet and a thinker. He's trying to think poetically. And he ends up philosophizing and theologizing, but first and foremost, it's a matter of trying to mobilize certain kinds of metaphors in order to make sense, it constitutes his weaponry, as it were, echoes of the sixth chapter of Ephesians, putting on the whole armor, as it were, in his context. This radical historicity, radical humility, and then tied to radical democracy. This mystical anarchism, and I do want you to say more words to our brothers and sisters of all colors here about what you mean by mystical anarchism. 
uh, uh, I, I like your radical democracy. I view the mystical anarchism as a kind of radical democracy. That's why so many of your writings resonate so deeply with the Occupy movement. Radical participatory democracy, suspicious of all forms of centralized power, whether it's in the public sphere, government often unaccountable, FBI, CIAs, military industrial complex, drones dropping bombs on innocent people and acting as if we do not, we ought not to have accountability and transparency and answerability, just keeping it always under the cover. Something we can learn from our anarchic brothers and sisters. Deep suspicions of centralized power in the public sphere. The kind of thing that G.K. Chesterton in his own quasi-anarchic distributed this way. Always suspicious of government in that sense. But of course also highly suspicious of centralized power in the private sector. Monopolies, oligopolies. You see, oligarchs, plutocrats at the top. And he has a fascinating reading on the plutocratic condition of the United States in light of his defense of using Judas Butler's notion of nonviolent violence in that way. And, and you are right, I, I noticed that shift. It reminded me in some ways of the conversation that I've had with uh, my dear brother Martin Luther King Jr. Because he's a radical pacifist. I recall spending many, many nights with my dear brother Desmond Tutu in Cape Town. He's a radical pacifist, too. And I say to them, Martin, of course, not directly. I speak to him every other night, but he doesn't show up physically. But he's there. With Tutu, I can call on the phone. They say, I'm not an absolute pacifist. I'm not a radical pacifist. I am like Brother Simon Critchley. I pursue all forms of nonviolent strategies and tactics in order to ensure that the wretched of the earth have their humanity affirmed and to assure that they can live lives of decency and dignity. But I also believe that there are moments in which circumstances under which violence is inescapable as a response to violence. It could be against Hitler. It could be spear of the nation against apartheid in South Africa. It could be in the United States, five, 10 years from now, the right wing fundamentally takes over, tries to chase me and brother Carl Dix, not just in jail, but keep us in there. I'm coming out swinging, just like you, brother. I know you're doing it for communist reasons. I got Christian reasons, but the swing got the same rhythm. <laughs> Simon would be swinging now. He wouldn't necessarily be swinging before, but he's swinging now, and that's real. Let me end this, three questions. One, I want him to say a bit more about the role of poetry because he spends a lot of time talking about fictions, supreme fictions that he gets from the great Wallace Stevens who of course was a student of George Santayana too. And say more about how we can use fictions and actually believe in them to a certain degree, but be used in such a way that it allows us to distinguish between a dead faith and a live faith. What John Henry Newman in the Gram of Ascent calls a no you know, ascent as opposed to a real ascent. Not just ascending the propositions, but a real ascent in which you're willing to live and die for something. Very few of us willing to live and die for a proposition. For mama, yes for cause that seizes your soul, yes, that is what a live faith is. And that's one of the reasons why when you go to school with poetry, you're already then pushed to the brink, life's abyss, and willing to make some kind of leap of faith because there's a fiducial constitution of existence. All of us have some element of faith, whether we're religious or not. Because there's, there's some role of trust, some role of loyalty. All these are notions tied to serious talk about the fiduciary element in experience. Think of Michael Polanyi's great work on personal knowledge in this regard. There's no escape in that regard. So it's not just a matter of religious faith. And even in the biblical text, you turn to Luke 18.8, where Jesus says, 
when the Son of Man returns, will he find faith on earth of any kind? Of any kind, not just religious faith. Because once you get the breakdown of faith, breakdown of trust, breakdown of loyalty, what do you have? Deception's hegemonic. Right? Deceit, hegemonic. Distrust, hegemonic. You can't survive. That's catastrophe on steroids. That's fascism so hegemonic. We can't even conceive of it unless we have examples. It could be Stalinism. It could be Nazism. It could be vicious forms of imperialism in the third world in the early part of the 20th century. But those are the kinds of challenges. So the first question has to do with poetry. The second has to do with mystical anarchism, as it were. Uh, uh, and the last question has to do with the ways in which your notion of, well, my notion of radical democracy that I'm in some sense imposing upon you, but I view again your conception of mystical anarchism as a species of radical democracy. Uh, everyday people in the language of Sly Stone having their voices heard in decision-making processes in institutions that guide and regulate their lives. Radical democracy, an autonomy against the state not imposing its will or the market imposing its will. But then the question becomes, what is the relation between radical democracy and radical love in a, a bit more detail? Because this text is distinctive in your corpus that I've enjoyed over the decades being so explicit about this radical love. And, uh, you know, I could be on a personal tip with Sister Jameson Webster because he's got a wonderful companion and things. I don't want to reduce this to biography, but if we're going to store size, we got to include folk in your life who gives you some sense of love and the ways in which this is now becoming more and more pronounced, as it were. I know both of you all are worth writing a book now on Hamlet. And what is distinctive about Hamlet? He's not just the greatest literary protagonist in modern literature, but he suffers from the incapacity to love, which is Dostoevsky's definition of hell. All those who suffer from the incapacity to love are living in hell. That's Fyodor. That's Dostoevsky. It's a fascinating formulation. Hamlet, you ought to be ashamed what you did to Ophelia. Hamlet, so philosophically sophisticated. Hamlet, so existentially committed to what? Others, love of neighbor, oh, legacy of Jerusalem. No, not filtering through that particular character. No, not a whole lot of hesed there, that Jewish gift to the modern world of conceiving of yourself as a human being who spreads hesed to orphan and widow and fatherless and motherless and weak and vulnerable the prophetic tradition that comes out of the best of Hebrew scripture. Hamlet is not connected to that at all. So that relation of radical love to radical democracy, is it true that the deepening of your understanding of radical democracy pushes you to want to accent much more what we call this prophetic tradition and therefore you end up talking so much about uh, uh, works of love filtered through Jesus of Nazareth to Christ of faith in that last wonderful chapter. But thanks so much for this wonderful book. I never know what to say after Cornell has spoken. It always, it always seems so, uh, so stupid in my silly, uneloquent voice. You can bring all these things together in this extraordinarily powerful way. It's, uh, it, it never ceases to amaze me. I mean, I mean what you said about the um, subversive traditionalism. I think this is a, such an important point. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. such an important point. I mean, the, um, the need to cultivate the past, right? Yeah, absolutely. You know, yeah, we, absolutely. Live in, we live in cultures where uh, are dominated by an ideology of the future, an ideology of the short and medium term future, That's right. cultures of systematic amnesia. And the most difficult thing to do is to, is to recall, is to, is to construct an archive is to go back. And what you discover when you go back in that, this is, this is the paradox of conservatism, right? Absolutely. The conservatism is the, conser is the conserving of a tradition, but that tradition is a subversive tradition Absolutely. that can allow you to, um, to attack the present in an incredibly powerful way. And when you, that, the quote from Santayana about religion is the love, of, um, the love of life in the consciousness of impotence, in many ways is the, is the thesis I'm trying to 
trying to make in in in, in the in, in the whole book. Yeah. It's it's um, trying to um, get away from a certain philosophical and political uh, obsession with with power and and potency, uh, and to think about you know what I called in my remarks uh, the powerless power. The, the powerless power of being human, which means, and this sounds like a strange thing to say, particularly when you're a man at my time of life, you know, uh, uh, the acceptance of a certain constitutive impotence in relationship to uh, action, that there is a certain, um, let's say, a fantasy of particularly masculinity, which you find um, all over philosophy and political thinking, which needs to be given up. What attracts me um, so powerfully to um, these uh, these medieval uh, female mystics oh, yeah. is is a, is a is a practice firstly a practice which is about giving up control and giving up control not as uh, as in, say, the male mystical tradition of, say, negative theology, where, in a sense, I can manipulate the antitheses like pseudo Dionysus and these people, and it becomes this sort of elaborate linguistic cognitive play of a relationship with God. With the, the figures that interest me that I try and deal with in this middle chapter, the relationship to uh, the divine is completely embodied. Yes, right? absolutely. It's, it's an incarnate uh, yeah, relationship to the to what is called the divine, and the experience of an emptying out, of an excoriation of, of that self. Um, and this leads, you know, the, the, and also I think I should say about the, the book is it, it's a series of experiments. You know, I don't, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm not in control of the material. There isn't a, um, you know, uh, mystical anarchism is a sort of weird thing to argue for. I don't completely argue for it. I, I, I use it, um, as 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 a you know as a guideline for thinking about a certain trajectory of resistance and insurrection that goes back into the Christian tradition and finds continuity in elements of the anarchist tradition. Gustav Landau is very important. There's a big influence on Benjamin, of course, mm -hmm. uh, into people like the Situationists who who mobilise that tradition, and I think into uh, some very recent. Uh, uh, radical political figures like the Invisible Committee and groups like that, who I think in many ways are mobilizing a certain um, uh, a certain position which is, has echoes of this uh, Mr. Klanikist background. Uh, a word on fiction. Um, I mean, the two things, I guess. Um, Hobbes in Leviathan uh, says that the, the Leviathan, or the, the discourse of politics, is the construction of an artificial it's soul, soul. Yeah. for an artificial man that is the Leviathan, the commonwealth. Politics is fiction. Right? We live in uh, a set of institutions which are fictional. And the more that one knows about the way those fictions were invented, were constituted, the better. The amazing thing in um, the history of, say, a country like the United States is the way in which uh, the prehistory of that, uh, the, fiction of, um, the fiction of absolutist monarchy, where, uh, where the authority of the king derived from God, switches round in the English Revolution into the fiction of popular sovereignty. And then that's played out again in the, uh, the years of the revolution. So popular sovereignty is a fiction. Okay. And the idea of we the people is a fiction. So one side of this interest in fiction is that, is that fiction becomes a powerful diagnostic tool for decoding certain political networks. So when a politician claims to speak uh, on behalf of we the people, you know, this is, a, this is a kind of, it's a weird fiction, right? And just think for a second how it happens. How does it happen that, I mean, as, as um, you know, I think 
the, the poet Fernando Pessoa says somewhere, I've, I've never seen humanity, I've seen human beings, right? And it's the same thing with there are people, but there's not the people, right? Mm -hmm. So politics uh, in a certain democratic fiction is about the constitution of this idea of the people and the people that somehow through the miracle of representation, through the vote, find their expression in representatives who govern them. It's a, it's a miracle. <laughs> but a moment's thought would reveal its philosophical naivety, right? I mean, how, how does this happen? So one of the things I'm trying to do in the book is to be aware of the fictions, in particular the fiction of representation. And in many ways, I think what was going on with the Occupy movement, one of the things that was going on with the Occupy movement was a critique of representation. Here we had a different form of political organization that was based on the General Assembly, right? Not representative, but presentative in some way. Mm -hmm. Second side to that um, is to say that fictions are not just things we can diagnose, fictions are things we can, we can also construct. To, to imagine a kind of radical democracy, as you call it, is right. to imagine another fiction, right? What I'm calling um, in, uh, in the book a supreme fiction, which mm -hmm. Stevens takes from his teacher Santayana, right? Yeah. Um, and a supreme fiction would be a fiction that we know to be a fiction, but in which we still believe. And mm -hmm. that's the trick in politics. Is that possible? Can we have a fiction that we know to be a fiction because we did it, God didn't do it, uh, we did it, but w in which we still believe. It's what uh, Stevens calls the fiction of an absolute or a fiction of final belief. And that, for me, is the, the trick. And if you look at the um, history of uh, uh, certain forms of radical thinking, be they uh, Marxist or anarchist or different varieties, that's, 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 the, um, that's the wager. When Marx, in 1843, when he introduces the concept of the proletariat, uh, the formula he uses for the proletariat is um, I am nothing and I will be everything. Right? I am nothing and I'll be everything. That is the construction of a fiction. Right? And um, politics is about the deployment of a certain fictional force. So this gives you, I think, on the one hand, an extraordinary um, set of diagnostic tools for thinking about different political forms, and then also, uh, if you like, an imaginative and poetic tool for thinking about um, some other way in which society could be organized. And, um, Wonderful. Wonderful. you know, I'm, I'm, I'm with you, Cornell, on the, you know, it's, it's um, you know, and, and I guess what you're being just too polite to acknowledge is the fact that my position has shifted to a position that's much closer to yours in between infinitely demanding and yours. But you're, you're far too much of a gentleman to, uh, to put I, me on this. I can be misleading at times myself, <laughs> but I, I, I'm glad to see you move in my direction on that. That's true, but, but we need each other because we're still fallible, you know. We learn from each other in this regard, though. But a radical love in relation to radical democracy, though, how do you account for your shift from uh, the Socratic question of how to live to the, uh, the prophetic question? And that's, you, you get it in Amos, you get it in Jesus, you get it in Muhammad, you get it in Martin King, yeah. you get it in Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel, you get it in Malcolm X as a prophetic Islamic brother. How to love, if you really love these people who are hated, despised, yeah. then you're gonna be over against. It could be black folk, it could be indigenous peoples, women, gay brothers, lesbians, sisters, workers, or whatever. If you really love these folk and make them a priority, you better get ready for a cross because the empire gonna come down on you in some way or another. Character assassination, literal assassination, whatever it is. And that's true for in our own lives until on the job and so forth and so on. It may not be bullets, but it might be symbolic ones. It might be metaphoric ones in that sense. And, uh, and, and, and that's that, I can feel that kind of intellectual passion in, in your text, that passion transform that you begin early on in talking about Rousseau. And Rousseau says he's got to refer, he's got to allude to art as a way of constituting a public, not a constituency. Mm -hmm. That's consumer talk. A public, that's citizen talk, right? That's democracy. We hardly even have a public these days. We hardly know what a public is. 
we just have class of special interest in constituencies. Where is the public? Corporate media? Please. And I'm not just talking about Fox News, MSNBC. You know, that's the Obama line, right? That's, that, that's ideologically shot through, too. No serious, and they both have a bipartisan consensus on no talk about a prison industrial complex, no talk about drones, no talk about poverty, no talk about oligarchy, no talk, no talk about plutocracy. In that sense, Ed Schultz and Sean Hannity, very similar. I like Brother Ed more politically, but they're still inscribed within oligarchic rule. One's conservatives, one's neoliberal. Where's the public? Where's the poor children in the discourse? Where are workers? Where are the, the poverty-ridden widows and so forth and so on, you see? And that's the kind of Socratic energy, what I'm calling critical engagement, mm -hmm. that I love about uh, your work. But still, that's at the political level, because you've got a philosophical level, you've got a religious level, then you've got the political level, and they're, they're moving in a wonderful kind of way. True, not just in this text, but in the text as a whole. It's a rich kind of musicality, a jazz-like uh, sensibility that I like. Well, I, uh, thank you. <laughs> the, the, um, I guess you're more sympathetic to the Socratic moment in a way than, than I am. It's, let me give you an example here that the, I think, you know, to, to, to allude to the, the title of this exhibition, the, the transition to Christianity is a very strange, very, perhaps the most difficult thing to explain, right? Yeah, Historically, yeah, how does yeah, this happen? Yeah. How does a, uh, how does a pagan imperial culture with a very sophisticated philosophical um, set of structures which find expression in people like Seneca and Cicero, right, right. And which feed on the various schools that were set up in Athens. How does that become Christian? I mean, it's, it's completely bewildering. Um, but in relationship to a figure like Socrates, when I read a text like the Phaedo, which is the, the fourth of the dialogues that uh, Plato dedicates to the trial and execution of Socrates. Mm -hmm. I see someone who wants to die in his own way, in his own time. They say to him, you know, you don't need to take the poison straight away. You could wait until later in the evening. He says, no, no, I want to take it now. Right? And he's, in doing that, he spins out these stories about the immortality of the soul that I don't think he believes for a second. Mm. Right? So I see the figure of the philosopher, in a sense, as selfish in a full sense, selfish. So what's going on in figures like Paul and um, afterwards is, is something else, something which is about um, a self-impoverishment, right? the transition from Saul to Paul, which is usually misunderstood, is a transition from someone who is, in, is doubly enfranchised as a Jew Hebrew born of Hebrews and as a Roman citizen becomes mm -hmm. nothing becomes nothing and through this adoption of this strange uh, cult of the resurrected Christ sets up a series of little cells that we now think of as churches but it was a bunch of people sitting around a table eating right? who had no identity either within imperial structures or within uh, traditions of Judaism and so there's a sense in which within the very beginnings of Christianity which is something that I think that, uh, has, been, has constantly fed it uh, in its movements of reformation, right, which define it, uh, has been that sort of insurgent, uh, uh, egalitarian discourse that's based around poverty yes. and self-impoverishment mm -hmm. and, and communities of love. Yes. And yes. I guess I don't find that in, in I find that... Um, you know, it's what someone like Badiou would call an anti-philosophical tradition. It's there on the margins in people like Kierkegaard, in people yes. like Pascal. Yeah. But it's not the same. And I suppose, you know, this... But I, yeah, yeah. I, I agree with you there. I, um, well, two quick things. One is that, you know, anytime we talk about institutions that we human beings have something to do with, especially religious ones that tilt toward dogma and certainty, uh, then we know that more than likely they're going to be adjusted to structures of domination. So when Constantine makes it a state religion, we've got full-scale accommodation to imperialism, and it becomes the empire's religion. 
And in that sense, you can just see Jesus saying, I told you this church would be predicated as much on Peter's denial and Judas's betrayal as the life that I tried to live. And we'll see whether the life that I tried to live will be able to filter through these institutional structures so that most churches these days shot through with market sensibility, chamber of commerce, religion. It's a miracle that you encounter Jesus in most churches, right? In the same way, you know, most synagogues these days are so assimilated to American middle class life. If you really take Amos seriously or really read Jonah slowly on Yom Kippur, you're going to have some serious critique of what's going on in the synagogue, you see, because religious institutions across the board, it could be Buddhist, it could be Hindu, it could be Christian, Judaic, or what have you, tend to be adjusted, well adjusted to injustice and well adapted to indifference toward the suffering of people. But when it comes to, so that, that's that prophetic element, that's why I use prophetic in that broader sense, that it cuts across secular, Christian, Judaic, and so forth. But on Socrates, and tell me what you think about this, see, in the case of Socrates, Socrates is very much like Hamlet. He suffers from the inability to love people. Mm -hmm. He loves wisdom, but he doesn't love people. That's why he, he, he never cries. You remember, the, uh, it's, who is it in the uh, Tower of London? It's um, Thomas More, right. Right, right? When he's sentenced, yeah. Yeah. you remember he writes the, the dialogues on tribulation. What is he yeah. wrestling with? Yeah. Why is it Socrates never cries and Jesus never laughs? And then the last thing he writes is the sadness of Jesus, which is another powerful piece. He's a Catholic brother, and the Protestants putting him in, they're going to chop his head off, be executed. Now, Thomas More, who's a comic writer, like his friend Erasmus, and praise the folly. He's a comic writer. Comedy's about what? Radical incongruity. Things don't fit. They're not consistent. I can't follow these dogmas, make sense of things. I keep running up against a logical dead end. They're inconsistent. Because to be a person of faith is not to look for a logical consistency. It's to deal with met the mess in the language of Samuel Beckett, the funk in the language of George Clinton. Things don't fit, but you have to somehow cope. You still have to keep moving in this sense. Now, in the case of Socrates, you might recall in the cell, the inner voice he's heard all of his life. The diamond. Yeah, the diamond. What does it tell him there? Practice the arts. And he thought all his time it was just practice argument. And what does Socrates do for the first time of his life? He writes a song. And it would be fascinating if we had a CD version of Socrates' song. Because he never wrote a word. Right. And what else does he do? He versifies the fables of Aesop. Who was Aesop? Slave, like Frederick Douglass, like Sojourner Truth, like Harriet Tubman. Socrates. Maybe I misunderstood my vocation. You're mm -hmm. crucial talk about call. Yeah. And there's no call without recall. There's no vocation without invocation. You can't have a calling and not be in conversation with the folk who you must recall to reinforce your calling. It's like Dostoevsky with no Schiller. There is no Dostoevsky with no Schiller because he's using Schiller as a launching pad for his literature across national boundaries. So in that sense, Socrates, for me, is indispensable, but inadequate. Uh -huh. okay. See what I mean? Yeah. So when I say Socratic in relation to you, it's the love of wisdom, the critical questioning. I still like that about Socrates, and I love that about you as well. But Socrates doesn't get to the legacy of Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. He doesn't learn how to love thy neighbor. And he certainly doesn't learn how to, uh, uh, to love his enemy as a human being. He's always referring to his own principles, his own principles and so forth and so on. Nothing wrong with principles, but in the end, you know, life is not about self-mastery as it was for Socrates. It is about tears. Mm -hmm. It is about crying. It is about laughing, or in the language of that genius from Jamaica, Bob Marley, is learning how to wail and still prevail. <laughs> and I say that to Barack Obama, because when he told black folk to stop complaining, he confused wailing with whining. You see, poor people are not whining. CEOs on Wall Street who can't get enough are whining. A whale is qualitatively different. That's why Bob Marley was Bob Marley and the whalers <laughs> rather than the whiners. That's very important because whine, wailing has to do with that help that, that, that William James was talking about. 
and that, 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 that Nathaniel West was talking about, help, help. That's what people, we need help. Our kids are being shot down like dogs. We need help. We can't get a job. We need help. We're sick. We don't have health care. We need help. Our houses are collapsing. Well, who's going to come to the help? You need to help yourself. Yes, we're going to organize and mobilize. That's right. <laughs> Against the powers that be. Because they have been helping themselves. mildly For a long time. Sometimes with very little principle. Sometimes immorally. And so forth and so on. But so it, I'm not sure we're disagreeing on this, on the Socrates in that regard. Yeah. Well, thank you, Cornell. It's been a great pleasure. Uh, absolutely, yeah. absolutely.